Um, Stewart is actually also the co-chair of the International Law or International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group, um, which organized this session, and we're very pleased to have him on. Um, Stuart, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. So obviously today we're going to be discussing international law and the plight of the Rohingya insights from international dispute, uh, dispute settlement. Now, this, uh, the situation of the Rohingya community in Myanmar and Bangladesh has been the subject of intense scrutiny by the international community. And our panel of experts are going to discuss the various ways in which international mechanisms are currently involved in that situation. And we're going to talk particularly about the ICJ and the ICC, but also some other mechanisms as well. Now, as Wes mentioned, obviously some events that have occurred recently could affect those. The, the result of the recent coup is something that I hope our panelists will have time to talk about. Uh, so we're going to proceed as follows. I'm going to briefly introduce our guests. Then each panelist will have five or seven minutes to speak a little bit about a a little bit about their particular area of expertise. And then we're gonna have a discussion between our panelists. I have some questions I've written to help get our uh, uh, discussion started, but we'll also take questions from the audience. You can use the Q&A function below to submit questions and I'll select some to present to our panelists. Okay, so let's talk about our panelists. We have four uh, uh, excellent panelists, all each with expertise in a, a relevant area. Let me, in no particular order, let me begin with Akila Radhash Krishnan. She is the president of the Global Justice Center. She directs GJC's strategies and efforts to establish legal precedents protecting human rights and ensuring gender equality. Akila has authored uh, numerous shadow reports, legal briefs, and advocacy documents, and provided legal expertise to domestic and international stakeholders and policyholders, policymakers, including the International Criminal Court, the United Nations, the European Union, and state governments. Prior to the Global Justice Center, she had worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, DPK Consulting, and Drinker, Biddle, and Reith. Uh, Akila received her JD with a concentration in international law from the University of California, Hastings, and holds a BA in political science and art history from the University of California, Davis. Our second, well, this isn't in any order, but the second panelist I'm gonna tell you about is Dr. Miriam Cohen. She is an assistant professor of international law at the University of Montreal. She's the author of Realizing Reparative Justice for International Crimes, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. She has published widely in the fields of international law and reparations, and her research has been supported by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Bar Association, the Canadian Council on International Law, and others. She earned her PhD in international law from Leiden Universities and a Master of Laws from Harvard Law School, the University of Cambridge, and the University of Montreal. She was previously an associate legal officer at the International Court of Justice and also worked at the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Court. As an international lawyer, a member of the Quebec Bar, Dr. Cohen has acted as counsel for Panama for the International Tribunal for the Law of Sea. And she's a member of the boards of directors of the Canadian Council on International Law and the Societe Québécoise de Droit International. Our third panelist is Michael Becker. He is an adjunct assistant professor of law at Trinity College in Dublin where it lectures on public international law and international human rights. From 2010 to 2014, Mike served as an associate legal officer at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, where he principally provided assistance to Judge Joan Donahue. He is a graduate of Yale Law School and is currently completing his PhD dissertation at the University of Cambridge on the role of international commissions of inquiry. Uh, he has published several pieces on the Rohingya, Rohingya crisis and the genocide convention case against Myanmar at the ICJ. And finally, we have Yasmin Ula. She is an independent Rohingya social justice activist who collaborates with different organizations on advocacy, media, and building alliances with young people from Myanmar. She was born in northern Rakhine state of Myanmar, and her family fled to Thailand when she was a child, and she remained a stateless refugee until moving to Canada in 2011. She has served as president of the Rohingya Human Rights Network, a nonprofit group led by activists across Canada advocating and raising public awareness of the Rohingya genocide. She was a research coordinator at the Free Rohingya Coalition, a global network of Rohingya activists and friends who share common concerns about Myanmar's genocide and the need for Rohingya survivors to play an active role in seeking a viable future for their community. So welcome, please, our panelists. Uh, and I think we're gonna begin uh, with Mike Becker, who is going to talk a little bit about um, 
fact finding in general. Go right ahead. Great, thank you, Stuart. And thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to join this panel today. Um, I've been asked to talk about fact finding bodies in connection with the situation of the Rohingya and the situation in Myanmar. But I think since I'm first up here, it would maybe be a good idea for me to summarize the situation a little bit in case people joining us today aren't familiar with it. And I'll try to be concise here. So the Rohingya um, are an ethnic Muslim minority based in Rakhine State in the west of Myanmar, which is along the border with Bangladesh. And for decades, the Rohingya have suffered from systemic discrimination and oppression at the hands of Myanmar's government. And that's true both during the long rule of the military, mil the military junta and during the brief period of democratic transition under Aung San Suu Kyi. The Rohingya are effectively denied access to citizenship and basic rights and have periodically been the target of state-sanctioned violence. So this is a situation of long-standing concern, but the events that really give rise to these recent efforts to use various international uh, judicial mechanisms to seek some kind of redress or accountability relate to two more recent periods of violence directed against the Rohingya by the Tatmadaw, Myanmar's military, who are now again in charge. Uh, and this is, these are events that date to 2016 and then especially August, September, 2017. As fact-finding reports, which I'm about to talk about and, and media reports have described it, the response to relatively low level attacks by a Rohingya insurgent group called the Arakan Rohingya, Rohingya, excuse me, Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Um, in response to that, the Tatmada mounted an overwhelming response. Described as clearance operations, that's the term used by Myanmar itself. This involved rampant human rights abuses and crimes, allegations of torture, murder, rape, and resulted in as many as 10,000 fatalities and resulted in more than 700,000 Rohingya seeking refuge in Bangladesh. So it's these events that have led to the pending case at the International Court of Justice that the Gambia has brought against Myanmar under the Genocide Convention, the preliminary investigation by the ICC prosecutor, lawsuit based on universal jurisdiction in Argentina, and all these things that we're going to hear about today. Okay, fact-finding bodies have played an important role in this process. They have laid the groundwork for these further efforts to make use of different judicial mechanisms, and they will continue to play a role in how those judicial mechanisms go about their work. I want to talk about or just identify in these kind of brief opening remarks four different fact-finding bodies that are important to be aware of and understand. The first is something that was called the Advisory Commission on Rakhine State. This was led by the former, uh, the late former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and operated in 2016 and 2017. This was a joint project of the Myanmar government under Aung San Suu Kyi and Kofi Annan's foundation. And it had a broad mandate to examine the complex challenges facing Rakhine State and to propose responses. It had three international members alongside six national members and its existence and operation were contentious, highly contentious within Myanmar. Its final report framed the situation in Rakhine as a development crisis, a human rights crisis and a security crisis. And I think it's fair to say that its analysis wasn't overtly legal in nature. It was a, a careful attempt, a diplomatic attempt to make recommendations aimed at alleviating the situation while maintaining a concili conciliatory tone, tone, but it was arguably too deferential to the state. For example, the report notes that at Aung San Suu Kyi's request, it does not use the term Rohingya. The timing of its release in August 2017 just before this second wave of widespread clearance operations against the Rohingya began, also maybe makes some of its measured optimism about political solutions look a little bit naive. That said, I think many of its recommendations for reform, especially around questions of citizenship, 
remain relevant and might end up in some way being incorporated into the types of relief requested or sought from the ICJ or the broader political diplomatic efforts um, that will be ongoing. Okay, second important to understand and be aware of is the UN Human Rights Council's uh, independent international fact-finding mission on Myanmar, which was set up in March 2017. It was set up between these two more recent waves of violence in 2016 and then later in 2017. So it was already in place and operating at the time of the August, September 2017 events. It had a mandate to establish the facts and circumstances of alleged recent human rights violations by military and security forces in Myanmar and in particular in Rakhine state. It was a much more law focused exercise as you might expect. Myanmar didn't cooperate with the UN fact finding mission so it had to do its work in other ways. It couldn't operate inside of Myanmar and that meant in particular devoting a lot of time to interviewing and taking testimony from people who had fled across the border into Bangladesh. It ended up producing four reports, all of which are substantial. This includes an initial 444 page report from September 2018, a follow up report a year later in September 2019 and two thematic reports. Importantly, uh, it concludes that many of the violations that it documents amount to crimes against humanity. And in the 2019 final report, it drew the conclusion that genocidal intent on the part of Myanmar can be inferred. It attributes most of those violations to the Tatmadaw and among other things, and now of special interest perhaps, it specifically singles out Min Aung Lai, who is now the man in charge in Myanmar as bearing criminal responsibility for what has happened. Um, the two thematic reports, one focuses on sexual violence and the other focuses on the business interests of the Tatmadaw. And that report, uh, its relevance may have a second life now because in the wake of the military coup, it lays out a blueprint for how pressure might be brought to bear on the military. So that may be newly interest, uh, interesting to people. I think there's a very strong case that the Gambia would not have brought the case against Myanmar at the ICJ, but for the work of the UN fact-finding mission. Now I'm already nearly at my time, so let me just very quickly mention two other fact-finding initiatives. One is the ongoing in independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar, also created by the Human Rights Council, um, which has a mandate to collect evidence of the most serious international crimes and violations. And this is specifically to provide support for future criminal prosecutions. So in many ways it carries over, it's kind of the successor to the UN Human Rights Fact-Finding Mission, but with an even narrower, more targeted mandate focusing on future criminal prosecutions. And finally, there is the Independent Commission of Inquiry for Myanmar, which is an entity that Myanmar itself set up back in July, 2018, while the UN Fact-Finding Mission was also operating. And this was in some ways a response to the UN fact-finding mission and an attempt to reclaim the narrative. It was made up of nationals alongside some international members, also with a mandate to investigate human rights violations in Rakhine. And it submitted its final report to the government in January, 2020, just three days before the ICJ indicated provisional measures against Myanmar. The full report has never been released, but we have an executive summary and some supporting annexes and in brief, that commission concluded that while some war crimes have taken place, there have been some human rights abuses, but these certainly are not genocide. And it essentially dismissed in very summary terms, any claims relating to sexual or gender-based violence. International commentators have widely described the Myanmar commission as deeply flawed and biased as a fact-finding body. And I'd be happy later to talk a little bit more uh, about that and what it might mean in terms of its um, relevance to the ICJ case in particular going forward. So these are four fact-finding bodies um, that have been relevant to this crisis. And I mentioned these without even talking about all of the investigations and reports that many different NGOs have put together and produced uh, over these last several years, documenting what has happened in Rakhine State and the plight of the Rohingya.
For me, a key question is how the ICJ in particular will make use of these reports. We know that the Gambia is relying very extensively on the UN fact-finding missions reports in particular. Uh, and in brief, I think it can't be taken for granted or assumed that the ICJ will be willing to rely on those findings, notwithstanding the fact that they did rely on them in certain ways in the provisional measures order from January 2020. So the challenge is that these reports and reliance on third party fact finding, the challenges that that poses for the ICJ is something I would uh, certainly welcome talking about later in the session. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you very much. And next we'll uh, move to Dr. Miriam Cohen to talk about the ICJ. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Um, so to start, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak here today. And I'd also like to invite uh, to thank the other panelists for their insights. So Michael, Akila, Yasmin, I'm very pleased to be here and I'll share some thoughts on the case before the International Court of Justice. And the purpose of my initial remarks is to shed some light on some of the relevant issues relating to the ICJ case to set the context for perhaps later discussion during the Q&A session. So as Michael mentioned, um, there have been various fact-finding missions and reports from uh, NGO, NGOs, um, specifically the UN Human Rights uh, Council mandated fact-finding mission issued a report finding reasonable grounds to conclude that Myanmar's military had committed acts of genocide against the Rohingya along with other atrocity crimes. So it was increasingly clear that a lawsuit should be brought against Myanmar to claim state responsibility in this case. And this happened only in 2019, November, when the Gambia filed the case against Myanmar before the International Court of Justice, alleging violations of the Genocide Convention for the manner in which Myanmar had uh, been treating the Rohingya. So this is the fourth case brought before the ICJ, uh, which concerned uh, alleged violations of the Genocide Convention. Um, in contrast with previous cases, this is interestingly the first one where a state party to the convention brings a claim for alleged violations of the convention that were not directed against it. So there's no direct injury to the Gambia in this case. So given that the judgment uh, on the merits would take a while and to prevent further violation of the convention, the Gambia filed also a request for the indication of provisional measures along with its application. So the court then issued a unanimous provisional measures order on January 23rd, 2020, following the hearings in December. The court ordered Myanmar to prevent genocidal acts, to ensure military and police forces do not commit genocidal acts, to preserve all evidence of the genocidal acts, and to report back to the court on Myanmar's compliance with these measures. So the, per the first report um, was filed in May 2020 and the second in November 2020, and these reports were and remain confidential. So in the order uh, indicating provisional measures, an interesting point is that the court did not go as far as the Gambia had requested. So for example, the Gambia had requested as commentators um, and, and specifically Mike has, has mentioned um, to specify in its order, the acts that amount to genocide, specifically in light of its uh, previous uh, jurisprudence and the court uh, did not specify those acts. So the Gambia had requested, for example, the court to provide a list of acts which must not reoccur. The court instead ordered Myanmar um, to take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within Article 2. So we can discuss this further um, uh, during the Q&A if, if it's interesting, um, but this is not a small uh, detail. In terms of compliance with the provisional measures, it has been noted, and again, it's, it's an, a matter for debate, I guess, or discussion. Um, some NGOs have claimed that Myanmar was failing to comply with the provisional measures considering some uh, of the recent uh, events after the, the order. Um, one question uh, that is central to the case, um, which is relevant in the merits phase, um, is the standard for the crime of genocide, that is uh, the specific genocidal intent. So this issue was raised during the provisional measures phase and the court rejected Myanmar, Myanmar's argument that given the gravity of the allegations, the court had to dig deeper into the existence of genocidal intent at the provisional measures phase. Uh, 
So this is a crucial question, as you know, for the resolution of the case. Um, the court found it was not necessary to adopt the high standard in the provisional measures phase. Um, so this question of this high standard required to establish the crime of genocide will be an interesting one for the me merits, and especially if we consider the jurisprudence of the court in the two previous uh, judgments concerning the genocide convention. So the Bosnia-Serbia genocide case and the Croatia-Serbia uh, genocide case. So different from um, those cases, and um, uh, perhaps we can discuss this a little further, um, where there were international criminal proceedings parallel um, or uh, previous uh, decisions in the Gambia Myanmar uh, case, the court will have, will likely have no parallel or prior for that matter, um, judgments from another international tribunal, but it will have the fact finding reports. Um, this is of course subject to how the ICC case evolves, which Akila is gonna discuss further. Um, so indeed on this point, Myanmar has recently filed preliminary objections and I'll mention this in a minute, um, which will delay the hearing on the merits of the case, which in turn could um, you know, make the ICC case and the universal jurisdiction case in Argentina evolve um, while we wait for the merits case in the, uh, before the ICJ. So um, providing um, the case or proving, proving the Gambia's case will entail an exercise um, of distinguishing this case from pr previous ones, which in part, again, turns on the question of finding genocidal intent. So here, one interesting point is the composition of the court has changed from the previous two cases. The law on the genocide has evolved. There have been decisions from international courts and tribunals in the international criminal law context, context nevertheless, which have interpreted the specific intent requirement and have developed the law on genocide. So in this case, one possible avenue is for the Gambia uh, to focus on arguing a specific framework where the court could find or infer the specific intent um, from the volumin voluminous evidence and how based on this evidence, there is um, uh, the proof of genocidal intent. This is not an easy uh, task. Um, and we have seen from previous jurisprudence uh, that the court adopts a very, very high uh, threshold and standard. So just briefly mentioning uh, other recent developments, um, Myanmar has recently filed the preliminary objections, which I've just mentioned, um, that effectively suspends proceedings on the merits. Um, it's too early to predict how these proceedings will unfold. Uh, the Gambia has until the 20th of May 2021 to file its observations on preliminary objections. The preliminary objections of Myanmar are not public, so it's not possible to know the exact arguments, but we can, from its arguments on the provisional measure states, have uh, some idea of what uh, the provisional, uh, of what the preliminary objections might look like. Um, so some of the objections that might have been filed could relate to existence of a dispute, which was a point that was mentioned during the provisional measure stage. The Gambia um, could uh, also be, there could be the argument that the, the Gambia is acting as a proxy to an international organization. And in this case is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC. Another question could be the standing of Gambia as a state not directly injured by the alleged genocide. Um, the court here, I'm, I should add that rejected this argument in the provisional measure state and found that any state party to the genocide convention can invoke the failure of another state party to comply with their obligation under this convention. So as we know, and we've mentioned already, um, there has been a recent military coup. This uh, coup has no direct impact on the case at the ICJ in the sense that it was filed by the Gambia against the state of Myanmar, however the state presently is. Um, however, um, there is one question is how the coup will affect the compliance with provisional measures and whether it will continue to engage with the court, um, not only the compliance, but also the reporting part of the provisional measures. So one final note, and again, just to set the context perhaps for uh, discussion later on, um, is the Gambia's application and the request uh, of remedies and the relief sought. 
So it's interesting that part of the relief asked for, the Gambia has asked that the continuing breach of the genocide convention obligations are remedied, that wrongful acts are seized and that perpetrators are punished by a competent uh, tribunal, which could include an international penal tribunal. In addition, it also asks for safe and dignified return of the Hurinha with full citizenship rights and a, non, and a guarantee of non-repetition. Well, this is it's not the only re relief requested, but it's significant as a request for reparations that takes into account the demands of many of the survivors. So be that as it may, while the case is still in its initial stages, it sends a strong message to the international community and Myanmar, obviously, that grave human rights violations cannot go unchecked, that atrocity crimes have been committed. The court recognized that the Rohingya is a protected group under Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, that their vulnerable situation demanded protection. There's a unanimous decision of the court on the provisional measure stage that sends a strong symbolic, uh, that has a strong symbolic value acknowledging the harm and suffering that the Rohingya continue to endure. I mean, there are of course no guarantees that the case will proceed to the merits phase in light specifically of the preliminary objections. But it's an important piece of the puzzle of accountability and ensuring justice for the Rohingyas. Accountability in this case uh, cannot not only mean international criminal accountability or state responsibility. It's, as far as I see it, it's all pieces of, uh, of, of a puzzle where we have to talk about redress and international criminal accountability and state responsibility for the acts that have been committed. So if the Gambia's case prevails at the end before the ICJ, it will have the consequence of establishing that genocide was committed against the Rohingya and attach state responsibility to Myanmar for these acts and likely uh, re the relief uh, sought by uh, the Gambia. So I think I'll stop here. I flagged a few issues that we might want to uh, continue in the discussion of the Q&As. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you very much. And next we have a discussion of the ICC. Akila, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Stuart. Um, and thanks to everybody for having me today on a distinguished panel of experts. Um, as Stuart mentioned, I'm Akila Radhakrishnan, the president of the Global Justice Center. We're an international human rights organization dedicated to advancing gender equality through the rule of law. And as an organization, we've been working on Burma since 2005, and particularly with a focus on justice and accountability for sexual and gender-based violence for ethnic minorities. And so we've been working in Burma since before there was a democratic transition. So a little bit of what we're looking at now um, and what the landscape looks like is not a huge surprise to us, nor is it to, you know, many advocates. And so, you know, I think we've all talked a little bit about why this is not a more, there could not be a more important time to be having this conversation. Um, and I'll highlight something. So a couple of days ago, Senior General Minang Lang, the military chief and now head of the country, gave a speech on state TV in which he asserted that no one is above the law. And of course, this was seemingly something to explain why Aung San Suu Kyi had been arrested. But of course, the irony here is that in Myanmar, the constitution does in fact put certain people, in particular the military, above the law. The structural impunity is paired with the fact that the government of Myanmar, civilian or not, has shown itself unable or unwilling to meaningfully investigate and prosecute any serious international crimes. Domestic efforts, including the most recent Independent Commission of Inquiry, are deeply flawed and our efforts to gloss over human rights violations, showcase the government's own narrative of what happened in Rakhine State, and present a veneer of accountability at best. It's these factors that led the Myanmar FFM to conclude that accountability is not possible domestically without an overhaul of the justice and security sectors. And I raise the issues of impunity and domestic accountability because I'm supposed to be talking about the ICC for two reasons. Um, first, it's long been clear that the only path to accountability in Myanmar is situated within the framework of international law, which is why the efforts we're discussing today are so important. And second, there's absolutely no doubt that the persistent impunity that has been afforded Myanmar's military was an enabling and emboldening factor to the coup. The Myanmar FFM put it best when they stated that Impunity for gross human rights violations has significantly and demonstrably contributed to the validation of deeply oppressive and discriminatory conduct 
enabled reoccurrence of human rights violations and atrocity crimes, emboldened perpetrators and silenced victims. And so that's really the landscape that we're faced with as we discuss what these ongoing efforts look like, both in the context of the Rohingya genocide and I think in light of the recent coup. Um, and, you know, just as, as Miriam has mentioned, the proceedings, there's the ICJ, there's the universal jurisdiction proceeding, and there's the ICC. And the ICC, like the universal jurisdiction proceeding, is focused on individual criminal liability, unlike the ICJ case, which is focused on state responsibility. And so as a starting point, it has to be said that Myanmar is not actually a state party to the ICC, and there's yet to be a Security Council referral to the court. So at present, the court does not actually have the ability to investigate crimes that occurred solely on the territory of Myanmar. So why are we even talking about the ICC here today? And that's because of an approach that to the court's jurisdiction that's been taken by the Office of the Prosecutor, who in July 2019 asked the court for permission to open an investigation into certain crimes within the ICC's jurisdiction, where at least one of the elements of the crime occurred on the territory of a state party to the court here, Bangladesh. And in November 2019, the pretrial chamber actually approved this request. And the court authorized an investigation into any alleged crimes within the court's jurisdiction committed at least in part of the territory of Bangladesh or on the territory of any other state party insofar as such crimes are sufficiently linked to the 2016 and 2017 waves of violence in Rakhine State that, that Mike described earlier. And importantly, temporally, the court authorized investigations into any crimes that may have taken place at any point after June 1st, 2010, the date of entry into force of the Rome Statute for Bangladesh, and as is relevant right now, any future crimes that may actually be connected back to the 2016 and 2017 waves of violence in Rakhine State. And in terms of specific crimes, the prosecutor is currently investigating the crimes, uh, the crimes against humanity of deportation and forcible transfer, persecution on the grounds of ethnicity and religion, and other inhumane acts, all of which they have identified elements of which actually occurred or a necessary element of which occurred in Bangladesh. Um, and it should also be noted here that the prosecutor has been clear that should evidence of crimes of other crimes within the court's jurisdiction arise, her investigation will actually include those. So this is what we're talking about here is what's been previously identified. And since the authorization, there have been a few updates which we can discuss in further detail in the conversation, but I'll note them briefly here. First, in September 2020, two defectors from the Myanmar military turned themselves into authorities in Bangladesh and have subsequently been transferred to the ICC's custody. The men in video testimony that has been released publicly have said that they've been ordered to kill all that you see and testified about atrocities such, such as systematic sexual violence, including to the fact that one of them stood sentry as fellow soldiers raped women. Now there are open questions right now as to whether the ICC will prosecute these men themselves and how the evidence they provide will be utilized in any proceedings that they pursue. Second, in August 2020, three legal teams representing Rohingya victims filed a request asking the court's registry to consider holding proceedings outside The Hague and in a state within a reasonable proximity to the Rohingya. And I think this is an incredibly important point because when we often talk about international justice, we talk about the distance of international justice to the communities that they're, soaking, ser that they're seeking to serve justice for. Um, and while the pretrial chamber actually dismissed the request as premature, they did note that the chamber will keep the possibility of conducting certain procedural steps in situ, perhaps in Bangladesh, under review. And so I think that this is another important procedural step. The ICC at the moment continues to investigate the crimes. There have not situated any, um, they have not instituted any particular proceedings yet. And so we've been waiting. And I know that just like with the IIMM, there's been certain constraints as a result of COVID that have inhibited the ability to conduct investigations. And so I think that has created a bit of a holding pattern here on where things are gonna be pursued. Um, and so the ICC, where, where we're at now, it's a really important starting point to break the cycle of impunity in Myanmar, but we should remember it's really limited because of the jurisdictional theory that the court is working under. So briefly, what's left out? First, crimes where all of the elements occurred on the territory of Myanmar. For example, any of the horrific and systematic crimes of sexual and gender-based violence. Those are, those are crimes that perhaps could be used as contextual elements for crimes such as persecution, um, but they're not ones that themselves can be prosecuted by the court under this theory. 
Second, and I think this is really important that we talk about this now, is the ICC, like the other efforts that we're discussing today, is really focused on the situation of the Rohingya. And, to, and it's really important to note that in Myanmar, impunity for international crimes isn't limited to the Rohingya. The military has been engaged in systematic and continued conflict with a range of ethnic groups, and conflict has recently escalated in Kachin, Karen, and Shan states. Importantly, um, the FFM did actually look at and document the crimes in these states, notably in Kachin and in Shan states, and the IIMM that Mike brought up has a mandate that actually extends outside the Rohingya to these crimes. However, at present, no concrete avenues have been pursued for these cases. In the wake of the Rohingya genocide, we actually increasingly saw solidarity from other ethnic groups with the Rohingya in their pursuit of justice, understanding that the fight for impunity is one that's connected. And even in the last week, we've actually seen increased solidarity from the populace at large, many of whom actually, I think, had protested in, in support of Aung San Suu Kyi at the ICJ with the Rohingya, with the, and, you know, based on the recognition of the military as a common, common enemy here. And so I think that we need to also be really talking about the imperative to broaden the pursuit of justice. So yes, let's talk about the, what exists now, but let's also talk about where else we need to go because this conversation is limited and there's a real need to bring justice to all who've suffered within the country. And this can include measures such as the UN Security Council referral to the ICC, the creation of an ad hoc tribunal, both of which have been recommended by the FFM, um, and I'm happy to get into some of these further along. So I think I'll stop here, but again, we can follow up on any of these points during the Q&A. Thanks so much. All right, thank you very much. And for our final distinguished panelist, we have Yasmin Ula. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting this together and for including me in this conversation. Um, it goes without saying that my community has witnessed some quite historical um, uh, something quite historical for the past year or so in terms of where our activism um, has come to its fruition. Um, one thing remains, however, that um, as soon as the provisional measures at the ICJ were granted, the appearance of the action alone seemed to divert you know, some attention away from, excuse me, some attention away from the survivors that really need help on the ground, both um, in Rakhine State and in Cox's Bazaar. Um, justice is somewhat a broad term that seems to be understood very differently from you know, the perspective of the international legal mechanism itself and the affected community like ours. And um, there is a lot of attempts to document the crimes by various interested parties, specifically on the very central tactic used by the military to inflict sexual and gender-based violence. Um, some of those attempts, unfortunately, has not really taken into consideration the re-traumatization um, that does not manifest itself straight away. Uh, take, it take a lot of time um, to, to really uh, comes up. The reparations or the repatriation um, that are being discussed are often you know, something that come up with, uh, within the discussions on the various justice mechanism um, that I've had with those on the ground. And um, the conversation almost always end up, you know, but how can the international community help us go home? Um, it is very clear that the priority of the community has yet to be informed by the legal mechanism at play and vice versa. So one of the reasons for this is that um, the destitute conditions in the camps and now at Basanchar where refugees have been locked away from having access to the outside world and you know, are highly at risk of further human rights violations, the priority of the refugees are unfortunately not at the forefront as much as the judicial system may serve the purpose to deter further violations or victimization. Um, it is retributive and not really restorative. Um, so this is without mentioning that the majority of Rohingya people not just within the camps lack the understanding of what the, the various international judicial entities and uh, what they can offer, including you know, the limitations and, and various different restrictions um, of these mechanism or these entities. Again, the priority for us have been survival and the longer it takes for us to see any tangible results from all of these you know, processes, uh, the more exhausted and weakened the community becomes. And one of the debilitating issues that keeps coming up um, on the ground is the lack of coordinated effort um, 
to inform the community and derive any initiatives for the community um, uh, from within the community itself. And the most effective way out of this um, may lie in the prioritization of what the refugees need um, rather than what would be the most um, splashy and, and the most newsworthy um, and addressing you know, some of these needs first. Um, not that the judicial processes are not important. We have seen some real fragility uh, of the military that have surfaced um, within, with it, you know, scrambling um, to put out reports like the ICOE um, or sending the de facto leader to the ICJ uh, and many, many more um, that, that has happened over the past uh, year. But for real change that would truly address the agony of the refugees and, and truly um, be sustainable would need to come from within Myanmar. And Akila mentioned a little bit of this. Um, it is, it lies within the attitude change uh, of the public. And, um, you know, since the, since this is our 10th day of the uh, third military coup since 1962, it is worth mentioning, you know, that, that the military strategy has not really changed. It's still divide and rule. It's still very much rooted in the legacy of the colonial history. It's still accumulation by dispossession. The key factor in all of the military's tactic has always been displacing people in order to, you know, um, derive economic gains out of those areas. And, um, a lot of the neoliberal governments um, in, the, in the international realm has always pushed for uh, you know, the greatest good, which is the economic growth and, and the ties um, to the military because the, the, the most of the um, national enterprise within Myanmar are owned by, by um, the military. And it, it's, it's often this that, that, has, um, that has been sort of neglected um, for the past decade. And, you know, that led to the NLD um, compromising various different, you know, aspect of democratization. And uh, this sort of led to where we are right now. And um, the, the one thing that I've, uh, that I've seen sort of working um, within, within trying to build some allyship within the country is that the change in the tone and the attitude um, of the people that I've worked with um, who are heavily, heavily influenced by the military propaganda um, have been changing and transforming slowly with a few convenings, with a few, you know, bridging of the gaps um, and with just having some sort of meetings and, and actually having a dialogue. And I think that that has to somehow be worked into um, how we address the issue of, of injustice and the violations um, that Rohingya have experienced. Um, I don't know how it would work into, you know, it would be worked into the, the justice mechanism that, that we're all talking about today, but this somehow needs to happen in order for, for the gap of, you know, so many misunderstanding and, and years of propaganda um, and years of, of uh, brainwashing that, that people in Myanmar have sort of had to go through. Um, it would not change unless this happened. And, and the reason why I brought this up is, is because Rohingya would actually need support from the ground, need support from people within Myanmar in order to be able to move on from this at all or be able to uh, you know, find a footing within their own country again um, and rebuild the community. It would need to come from you know, working alongside with other ethnic communities as well as the people in Myanmar. Um, you know, in, in terms of finding acceptance and, and reintegrating into the society at large. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for your uh, words. We're gonna open up the discussion. Um, so if people wish to, in the audience, wish to submit questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom to submit a question, and I'll try and use some of those as part of our discussion. To lead things off, I have a question for, for Yasmin, and that is, um, what do you expect, D does the recent coup, does that make things worse for the Rohingya community in, uh, in Myanmar? And the flip side of that is, if the protests are successful and Aung Suu Kyi is returned to power, does that make things better? Um, the thing about the coup is 
there is a lot of shift in the mindset and the understanding of how fragile the democratization, the previous democratization uh, process was. And um, although this is a slow process and, and we're seeing, you know, a little bit um, more resistance to it as well, um, people this generation, I'm not trying to be ageist at all, um, seem to have a better priority of where they want to see their country um, end up. And, and they have sort of been informed by the 88 generation, the Saffron Re uh, Revolution, that the call for, you know, um, a release of a politician will not really change um, anything on the ground, will not really transform the, the culture of impunity or the sort of corruption that's written within, you know, within the various different uh, uh, aspects of the government. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the military has been using this one tactic uh, to appease to various different ethnic communities for very, very long time, which is, you know, paying them, um, paying community leaders and um, try to, you know, get some sort of cooperation and, and uh, sympathy from the people on the ground so that they support the military for the time being, because right now the military is, is viewed as, as uh, in a very, very negative light. And um, what happened on the ground for the past, you know, 10 days was that uh, uh, many community leaders in Sitwe, in uh, the capital of Rakhine State, have been paid and have been um, uh, communicated and, and sort of, um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, talked to and, and really convinced um, on the 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 you know the the legitimacy of the um, the military's action or the coup itself, and um, strangely, um, they've also added another perk of this of this coup to calm the ethnic communities down because we know that Rakhine people are starting to to feel this this um, heaviness to feel the 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 results of um, of the you know Rohingya genocide um, upon them and they're they're starting to see that the military is not really working with them and to try to convince you know the, the public majority within Rakhine state was they restored um, the full uh, 4G internet um, for the past few days and I actually even got a call from my own family on the ground um, and that's just something that they're trying to do um, and one thing to to remember and I will leave you know, I'll, I'll, I'll not speak more on this, but the one thing that the military is trying to do right now, you know, across the board is to try to legitimize their own uh, uh, doing, their own actions in, you know, uh, overthrowing democratically elected government and basically show, showcasing that they can do a better job and, and try to instill the, the the idea that, you know, they will always be the supreme power of the land and that, you um, you know, without the military, the, the country will have to shut down for them. It is very egotistic, but this is how they're going to try to play. Hence, we see the, the General Min Ong Lang coming um, to, you know, coming out and, and doing a press release saying that the foreign investment or foreign policy will remain the same. Um, they're quite scared of the, the, the sort of um, tremendous effort that the people in Myanmar are are showing um, in in not only um, you know voicing their own uh, dissenting views, but also um, in large number people are coming together and really really confronting the idea of having the military in power um, for the foreseeable future. And so um, the reason why I, I even brought up the 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 need for us to work with people on the ground, work with people in Myanmar is because of that, because of slowly the, the attitude is changing and the young people are, you know, sort of taking that that front, um, that forefront um, position in, in all of these conversation and they're changing their attitude and their understanding that things are not going to change unless we actually change and shift our mindset away from what the military has told us was true and legitimate. Can I just add something in here, Stuart? Um, and I think that is to really, in one of the things that I found kind of startling over the last 10 days is you see a real disconnect between the calls from the ground, the calls from what the community is asking for and what the international community is willing to pursue or say. And so weirdly, what we're talking about today, justice and accountability, 
has not really been on the table. And so there's this sense in the way that the international community has been pursuing the response that if the generals take back the coup, if they just kind of reverse it and let Aung San Suu Kyi out, that we can kind of go back to the status quo and pursue where we were at, you know, on January 31st of this year, which is allowing this constitution that allows the military to stay in power, allow them to negotiate what these power dynamics look like. And that's very different than I think what the calls of the ground are, which is we want the military out of our politics. We want the military to no longer have the ability to control this government. And we want them to be held accountable, not only for what they've done to us in the past, but also for what they're doing right now. And that disconnect, I think, is something that's really interesting in the ongoing conversation we're having today about justice and accountability. Okay, thank you very much. Miriam, I have a question maybe that you'd be in a good position to answer. Do we expect the, the coup to change the Myanmar's approach to the ICJ case? And if so, how might that, what might that look like? So thanks. Um, so as I mentioned before, I think there won't be a direct impact because the case was brought by the Gambia and it will continue. Um, but the impact could be at the phase we're at is the phase of compliance with provisional measures. And as we're hearing, you know, the, the situation on the ground is, is very fragile. So how can we expect compliance with the order of the court um, in light of the coup? Um, also the engagement with the court, the court. So, you know, there's the compliance, but there's also the reporting, as I was mentioning. If this continues, then will Myanmar continue to report to the court as the order uh, requests it to do? Um, how will you know, the hearings on preliminary objections uh, continue as we see uh, the preliminary objections were filed uh, just prior? Um, so then how will that you know, continue to evolve? Will the same legal team uh, be present? How will Myanmar uh, position itself before the court um, in light of, of the coup and the continuation of the proceedings. But of course, the proceedings on the merits, if they go forward after the preliminary objection, is, it's, it's a few years from now. So much can change uh, from now until then. Um, so the, the short answer, I guess, right now is that there's no direct impact in the sense of the, the case won't just suddenly drop and, um, and, and cease to exist before the court. Um, but there could be an impact in the sense of how it evolves in terms of the engagement of the respondent and in terms of the uh, provisional measures that, that ex exist uh, at, at this point. Um, I know uh, that perhaps others, uh, maybe Mike or Akila or Yasmin uh, might, might want to chime in. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess that, that would be my, my short answer. Great, thank you. I think Mike, you did want to say something about this too, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, I agree with with um, what Miriam ha has said, but I think a really big question here is also really whether the government will continue to participate at all, whether they will appear going forward. The preliminary objections that were just filed were presumably filed and prepared just before all of this happened. Um, and so I think it's a big question whether they will simply uh, decide not to show up. Now, as Miriam has said, that wouldn't uh, end the case. And it's important for people to understand, um, and particularly people not familiar with the intricacies of the ICJ, to understand that a case can continue on as long as the Gambia wants to continue pursuing the case. Um, and the court can ultimately come to a judgment on the merits, assuming the jurisdictional objections are rejected. But the court will still undertake its own searching analysis and decide whether the allegations are well-founded in fact and law. Um, a second question though related to that is even if Myanmar decides to continue participating, I have a serious question about whether their lead counsel, William Shabis, will want to continue participating. Um, it was controversial for um, Professor Shabis to decide to uh, take up this representation. And whatever you think of that choice, I have to wonder whether he would, would still be comfortable sitting alongside the generals at council table, as opposed to sitting alongside Aung San Suu Kyi. And I think that could have a big impact on how the case actually gets argued. Okay, um, I guess Akila, a question that maybe should go to you. We've heard a couple of things about this Argentinian universal jurisdiction case. Could you speak to a little more to what that is and how it might interact with the ICC case, in it, if, it, if it does at all? 
Sure. So the Argentinian case is a case that's been filed by an NGO that's based in the UK, um, and they have filed a case against Aung San Suu Kyi and a couple other senior generals in Argentina under the theory of universal jurisdiction. Um, and so where that case is at right now is um, it's been going through kind of some behind the scenes procedural work. So the court initially had rejected um, the case and then it was appealed. And then the, what they did was they actually asked the ICC to, in, a, in kind of an odd reverse complementarity sort of analysis, um, they'd asked the ICC to let them know that what they would do in Argentina wouldn't actually overlap with what the ICC is doing. Now, usually that's the investigation the ICC would take is to make sure that the cases they're taking um, on board, you know, aren't actually going to overtake any domestic prosecutions that are ongoing. And as we understand it recently, the ICC has actually submitted something back to the Argentinian court. And so those proceedings should be picking back up shortly, um, as I understand it. And so we will kind of continue to see where that goes. Um, I mean, I think similar to the ICC, you've got some real questions around even the ability to arrest and proceed with prosecutions because Myanmar has, of course, re refused to comply. Um, and so I think we'll see what some of those are. Um, and, you know, the, the conversation we've talked a lot about is um, in, in the context, Miriam talked about this in the context of the ICJ, is usually you've had some sort of criminal proceedings underway, findings, judicial determinations underway as you look at state responsibility. And so the pace of these cases, depending on where things go, may or may not be influential not only in what the ICC can do, but also in what the um, potentially the ICJ takes a look at. And so I think there are open questions here, but again, this is another, this is a, an effort specifically for individual criminal responsibility for the Rohingya genocide. Yeah, so I'm sort of, as an international criminal law specialist myself, I'm sort of interested in this question. I mean, so as a theoretical matter, could a universal jurisdiction case deprive the ICC of jurisdiction? And if so, is that a sort of an, a reasonable interpretation of the Rome Statute? I mean, I, I think it would depend on how the ICC looks at it. I think one thing that we're talking about here is though the ICC, as they're currently proceeding, is looking at an incredibly limited subset of crimes. And so an open question whether a universal jurisdiction case on genocide um, would deprive, you know, could at least would be viewed at all as overlapping with the ICC on crimes against humanity. Um, and I think probably not, right? I, I think certainly here there's quite a bit to be looking at in terms of prosecutions. And so I don't even think that they're necessarily gonna be looking at the same fact basis unless the ICC's jurisdiction is broadened. Okay, thank you. I have a question from the audience and I'll let you decide amongst yourselves with panelists which, who you wants to try to answer this. But the question is, how is the way in which the IC, ICJ has framed its provisional measures, mostly repeating the obligations already existing un, under the Genocide Convention, how has this affected compliance by Myanmar with those measures and the perception that Myanmar is not complying with those measures? So I'll, I'll just kick off, I guess, the, the answer. Um, but I, but I will, uh, I will just mention that uh, that Mike has an article on on this, so I'll, I'll invite you to um, to answer um, if you if you would like. Um, I, I think my I think my view here is, you know, you have to look at the perception as the question um, directs us to, um, but also we have to look at the willingness to comply, right? So. Um, if the court was to uh, do what the Gambia had asked it to do, which is specify the different acts under Article 2, um, it could still, you know, if, if Myanmar is not going to comply with the order, it wouldn't comply even if it was specified, right? So you could, you could look at it that way in the sense of, you know, if Myanmar is going to comply, Article the, the way that the court phrased it um, would be sufficient for Myanmar to comply. Um, but then there's the question of the perception, which the court left it quite open um, in terms of how it it phrased its uh, its order, um, and, and and then uh, Myanmar uh, can look at it in the sense of well, but we these acts are you know not acts committed with the specific intent to commit genocide. So then we look at this order um, and we interpret it as it doesn't really apply 
um, because it's talking about genocide, which we claim that is not happening because we don't have the specific intent. Um, so, so that's, I, I guess, my my kickoff of the, the the response is that you know the willingness to comply versus the perception um, that we're talking about as to did the court leave the door open to have this perception that Myanmar is not uh, complying precisely with the order? And I'll, I'll let others chime in. Could I come in on that? Um, and thanks for uh, mentioning my piece coming out on the provisional measures order, Miriam. Um, it's great to be on a panel with Miriam in particular because unbeknownst to some of this audience, we shared an office at the ICJ for well over a year at one point. So we know each other well. Um, I think that on this provisional measures compliance question, I have been uncomfortable by some of the um, reports that have come out since that declare Myanmar to be um, ignoring the provisional measures or in breach of the provisional measures because there's an interpretation question here and it's an ambiguity that is in some ways a problem of the court's own making because they refer in the provisional measures order to their direction is that Myanmar must take all, all measures within its power to do such and such things, but those things are really live up to your obligations under the genocide convention. And the very case is about whether certain types of activities do or do not violate the genocide convention. So I think that the most reasonable way of actually understanding what the court ordered in the provisional measures um, order from January, 2020 is that Myanmar needs to refrain from intentional acts of violence directed against the Rohingya. That's how I would interpret it. And that's a very low bar really. So in the sense that we haven't seen incidents of mass atrocity, like we saw in August and September, 2017, since the case has been filed, well, if that's your bar, there has been compliance at kind of a low level. Um, I'm not comfortable with uh, interpretations that condemn Myanmar, for example, for not having begun to undertake actions to undo a system of systemic discrimination and oppression directed at the Rohingya. It would be great if Myanmar did that, but I don't see their failure to have done that as indicating non-compliance with the provisional measures because that type of structural reform that type of relief goes way beyond anything that the ICJ would have intended its order to mean. And they certainly wouldn't have suggested or demanded that Myanmar do those things by implication. Um, so I'm uncomfortable with those types of kind of condemnations of Myanmar saying, well, they're not, they're totally ignoring the provisional measures. I just don't think that that's correct. Now, that's not to say there haven't been problems at the margins that may in fact be um, examples of non-compliance with the provisional measures. There were some very, uh, were some very disturbing accounts from last spring, which seemed to suggest that uh, abandoned villages that Rohingya had been forced to flee from were being burned to the ground once again or bulldozed. So you see the destruction of evidence that would be in breach of the court's order. And there have been um, uh, there are continuing restrictions on movement. There are questions about the way that Rohingya still within Myanmar in camps have been treated, whether um, COVID related measures have been applied in a particularly discriminatory way towards Rohingya. So whether those things fall within the provisional measures or not is a harder question, but we haven't seen kind of mass atrocity that would clearly be in breach of the provisional measures. I pipe in here. So I think it's there's there's also something really interesting that's going on with the way this is being carried out in the moment, which is that there's a dichotomy kind of between these somewhat staid legal proceedings, right? They're very legalistic in in language, in what they're looking at, and the kind of robust and continued advocacy for the failure to deal with meaningfully kind of see any change in a situation for over a million people who are living outside of the country in camps for 600,000 people in a country where they are still under the, the threat, of, they were under the threat of the military before the coup. Um, and so I think what we're also seeing in terms of what these responses are around, what is compliance with provisional measures as well, here's an opportunity and a hook for us to utilize something to try to change the scenario. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to keep in mind here is that when you talk about, you know, what's going on, how to analyze it, <clears throat> 
well, there's just, it's been an intractable situation and people are looking for what are the potential hooks to try to make the case for the transformative resolution that we need to see? Because ultimately we can't wait for the ICJ cases resolution to actually work on the structural reforms that the Rohingya need to be able to actually return home safely, to be able to rebuild their lives. You know, you can't hold the ICJ case as a holding pattern um, for the real life implications of what's going on. And I think that that's something that is something we have to keep in mind as we look at, at the scenario, how the context is being played out. You have this wonderfully robust advocacy from the ground. And I think it's really important that we don't dismiss that um, as these proceedings go in play because there's a need that these proceedings aren't just about a legal determination at the end of the day of genocide happened, which may or may not affect anything ultimately other than declaratory relief. And to actually think about how these are all important tools against the battle, you know, against impunity to make sure that these crimes don't happen again. So I just want to kind of add that layer into this conversation. Great, thank you. Next up, we have a question from the, the audience. Uh, someone in the audience asked, uh, basically, what is the role of the Rohingya in these various uh, mechanisms? Like, what is the, do the Rohingya have a right to participate at the ICC? They're, obviously, the Rohingya themselves are not a party to the ICJ proceeding. What right do they have to participate, or how are they able to participate in the ICJ proceeding? So this is open to anybody who wants to comment on that question. Okay, Akila, maybe you could start us yeah, off because I, I, sure. I there is victim participation. I know that I know there is victim participation yeah. rights at the ICC. Do you know anything about how that's uh, working out? Um, I mean, I, I, I can I can start. I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I want to be cognizant of that. Um, so there there are, um, as I mentioned um, in uh, you know last year, there were some filings made by victims representatives asking for the court to consider moving um, you know, some of the, the proceedings in situ. So there is um, efforts to engage local community with the ICC. The ICC at least has established procedures for what some of this looks like. So I think you know, that's, that's one place. The ICJ, of course, has really no room for, it's not about victims, this is about states. So, you know, the Rohingya are in an odd way, the objects of the conversation of what's going on at the IC, um, at the ICJ, right? Like we look at them at a distance and say, this happened to you. This is about a state asserting your rights. Really, this is about the Gambia's rights. It has nothing to do with the rights of the Rohingya. Um, and, you know, there have been efforts that have been made by Gambia's council to include the community, um, you know, in the hearings directly. Um, they were, you know, there were, there were efforts to brief the community as the proceedings were happening in The Hague back in December 2019, holding kind of, you know, after the after the court, there were there were some direct engagement with community members who were there. So I think there's some of that there. Um, and in terms of Argentina, I actually don't know enough about the Argentina case to be able to comment on uh, what victims participation will look like. I will say the case is being brought by a Rohingya advocate and a Rohingya group. And so in that context, it is directly related to victims participation because you are actually bringing the case on behalf of um, individuals who've been affected by, by the genocide and they are having a say in the legal strategy that's going into that case. Yasmin, do you have any thoughts about either about the victim participation that exists or about how we could improve uh, the, the role of the Rohingya in this whole process? Um, there is a little bit of uh, uh, participation of uh, victims um, with the uh, IIMM uh, as well as the ICC case. Um, there is, I think there is somewhat of a participation of the victims on the ground um, in Cox's Bazaar specifically uh, with the lawyers from uh, the Gambia's team. Um, in terms of how effective or whether or not those those participations are um, helpful, beneficial to the the victims community, it, it's really really hard to tell right now. And uh, I don't think that we're going to see the effects of of those participation and um, our involvement in a lot of these uh, justice mechanism until much later. Um, a lot of times, this is the pattern. Um, we we won't see this manifests itself uh, until the community has the time to settle down and actually stop surviving and actually get to thrive. Um, and that's, that's 
basically the summary of all of all of my understanding in, in terms of the victim's involvement in, in these different processes. Um, it is unfortunately still very lacking um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the sort of um, encompassing uh, uh, nature of how these, you know, mechanisms can really affect people's lives on the ground. Um, most of the participations are being um, had mostly through uh, leaders within that community, uh, youth group or, you know, civil society groups that exist on the ground, specifically in Cox's Bazaar. Um, victims community within Wakhine State have not yet been able to be accessed, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of the participation so far have not really led to a general understanding of what the processes can actually affect them in the long term. And, and that's my fear. Um, it, it, it's very, very, um, it's amazing right now. We, we feel great about, you know, the attention that we're getting, the, the sort of deterrence effects that, that, um, that these different mechanisms are having on the perpetrators, um, specifically the people in position of power who can really um, affect changes or, or at least make the decisions. Um, but the the reality on the ground is still the, the 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 very very destitute conditions that people have to face day in and day out and it does not really um it does not really produce the the kind of uh you know involvement or or the kind of understanding that that i would have wanted um and and i think that a lot of people will feel the effects mostly negative um you know from from all of these participation, especially um, the collection of testimonies and various different uh, uh, re-traumatizing uh, sort of um, uh, roles that they have to play in in all of these uh, different uh, processes. So I can say that involvement is happening, but is it happening? You know, in the level that the the victims are understanding what they're signing up for? I'm not entirely sure. I will say that that is not a problem unique to this situation. That is a problem we see uh, throughout. For, for example, that's a, a common critique of the ICC is that their involvement with victim uh, communities has been superficial and sometimes uh, perhaps unhelpful. But I, I, I'm not, I don't know that anybody has a good solution to this problem either at this stage. Uh, Mike, I think you had something you wanted to say about yeah, that. I wanted to add one, one point on the same Topic. I mean, so the ICJ is not a very uh, victim or survivor friendly institution in, in a lot of ways. And I think there's been a missed opportunity here. And for those who follow me on, on Twitter or wherever know that this is a, a drum I've been banging on for a while. As part, as Miriam mentioned in the provisional measures order, there's a reporting requirement. And Myanmar has to submit these periodic reports on what it's doing to implement the court's order. And I've made the case along with others that these reports should be public. And part of the reason for them to be public is that my understanding is that there are people in the camps in Bangladesh um, and elsewhere who feel like they are particularly disconnected from the process and that the fact of these reports being confidential has perhaps in some instances been misinterpreted as the court not taking it seriously or the court simply accepting at face value, whatever it is Myanmar is putting into those reports. And uh, so others, so I've made the case um, that uh, along with others that there's no legal obstacle to the, to the court deciding at least going forward to make these reports public as the case is going on. It's unfortunate, I think that the Gambia when they requested a reporting requirement didn't specify that it should be a public reporting requirement. And this would be a fairly simple way to show some acknowledgement from the court, I think, that there is a broader community um, whose interests are in play in these proceedings, that it isn't just between the Gambia and Myanmar. Uh, and this would be, uh, this is within the, the realm of possibility in terms of something the court can do. There was some interest in December, the court announced that it's creating a new internal mechanism to review compliance with provisional measures. And so maybe going forward, we will see the court, if not in this case, maybe in other cases, be more interested in having these types of implementation reports be public. But I see this as a simple way that the court could um, involve 
uh, the broader community that has an interest in this case in what's going on. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, we're nearly out of time, but I think we have time for at least one more question. This one comes from the audience. And the question is about the interaction of the facts found by these fact-finding bodies and the ICJ. And if the question is essentially, can the ICJ rely on evidence collected by these fact-finding bodies? And if not, does it have the capacity to carry out its own investigations or, and or how will it decide what the facts what, what the facts on the ground are. So I think maybe Miriam and Mike, you are both uh, well-placed to answer these questions. Shall I take the first crack at that, Miriam? Sure, go ahead. Is that all right? Um, this is what I mainly prepared for, for today's session. So I'm glad the question came up. Um, in general, I'll try to be concise about this. In general, when the ICJ has been asked to rely upon third party fact finding in the past, they have shown a greater level of comfort in doing so when those facts are generated through a court like process. So that's why we've seen the ICJ was perfectly willing in the previous genocide convention cases to rely on findings of fact made by the ICTY. And we've seen in other instances like in the armed activities case, the ICJ was willing to credit factual findings made by the Porter Commission, which was a Ugandan uh, judicial inquiry that operated in a court-like manner. It's much less certain when or to what extent the court is willing to give weight to third-party findings that aren't generated through a court-like process like that. And so it's, that's not to say that the court won't, but it, it's simply much less certain. And the court has pointed towards things like whether reports are based on comprehensive sources, produced by individuals having an independent status and whether they're being carried out at the request of a UN organ, um, that doesn't actually provide much clarity. And I think it's kind of questionable on its face because um, there, it doesn't really get to whether the, the method actually undertaken by the fact-finding body stands up to rigor. I will just say this, the UN fact-finding mission created by the Human Rights Council has done probably as good a job as any fact-finding mission I've looked at in terms of trying to lay out in a very comprehensive and transparent way what its fact-finding methodology was. That's a really good start. And I think in terms of convincing the ICJ to credit what the fact-finding mission found, they're going to need to continue explaining that. And it stands in sharp contrast to, the, to Myanmar's own commission which is happy to criticize and throw stones at the UN fact-finding mission um, and lay out all these, this lofty language about the standards that need to be adopted. But those are standards that Myanmar's commission does not appear to have made any effort to meet itself. Um, the last point I'll make is that I've suggested in other writing that I think it would be a really good idea for either the Gambia or the court itself to call as witnesses the people who were involved in producing any of the reports that it's being asked to rely upon. So that questions about methodology and choices and gaps in those records, because I'm not saying that the UN fact-finding mission reports aren't open to some avenues of criticism, but so that the people involved in creating those documents can rebut those criticisms or respond to those criticisms in person. And we don't end up in a situation where the court ends up deciding not to rely on a report because there's uncertainty uncertainty that could have been probed and looked into if you had those people in the Great Hall of Justice testifying and responding to judges' questions. So just to add on that, I, I, fully, I fully agree with Mike and the idea of bringing them to testify is, I think the, it's, it's the solution to the, the, the situation here. And I would also add that this is not, in my, in my view, going to be a first off and only case where the court will have to rely on fact finding missions. The court doesn't have any investigators. Um, at some point, you know, these are where the facts are, 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 are related. So um, bringing them in and, and having this more kind of proactive approach of asking them questions to verify, you know, the credibility of the report and so forth, I think would be a, the solution to, to be able to use, uh, to use these types of reports because in, in, in future cases, I mean, the question will, will come up again and, and this could be a, a situation where the court could build the framework for when and how and what situations do we use fact-finding reports. 
when specifically we have, um, and I guess going back to the previous question, um, a case where in the nature of the court's uh, workings, you have two, uh, two states, but it really affects individuals, right? And the individuals, because of the way the court operates, cannot go in there and they cannot give their testimony. And uh, you know they, they're part of the narrative, but they're not part of the proceedings, right? So you need to rely on these fact-finding reports more and more when the court deals with situations, um, cases that bring about uh, human rights conventions specifically the genocide convention. So I, I don't think this is the first off and I think thinking ahead and thinking about how it's going to um, make use of those types of reports in those types of cases is a, is a very important exercise for the court to grapple with. Okay, um, maybe one last question. I'm not sure who's best placed to answer this, but do we have any sense yet of what the Biden administration's approach to this situation is going to be? And is it gonna be different from the, the Trump administration's approach? No, nobody wants to touch that one. <laughs> uh, I can I can take a stab at it. I mean, I think I, I just saw right before we started this panel that there were rumors that the Biden administration is about to impose sanctions on the military. Um, they've come out swinging in terms of strong language. Um, and as we understand it at the Security Council debate that took place last Tuesday at this point, um, the U.S. was one of the stronger members of the council in terms of supporting actions that potentially could be taken. So I think in terms of bilateral action, we're going to see that perhaps the Biden administration is actually going to be a country that others will follow, um, at least when it comes in terms of sanctioning. Um, obviously, I think when it comes to international justice, the US is just not a good player in this arena. And we saw the reaction just a couple of days ago to the ICC's Palestine decision around what they think jurisdiction is, the court's jurisdiction is supposed to be and how it's supposed to be interpreted. Um, and so I'm not sure necessarily that um, the US is going to come out as strongly as, as they could when it comes to questions of international justice and accountability. Of course, they've, su they've supported referrals to the ICC before. Um, they did in the context of Libya. But I, I think to me that remains an open question. And thus far, what we've seen from the Biden administration, kind of in terms of questions that, are, that have been raised, not in the context of Myanmar, but in the context of Trump's executive order on sanctioning ICC officials, the response to the Palestine decision is that it's probably not gonna be all that different from many, you know, all kind of US administration's approaches to international justice, which is we'll support it when it's convenient, but, you know, we'll only go so far because we have serious concerns about our own, um, you know, accountability of our partners and our own and what we could be opening up there. Okay, so does anybody have any last thoughts or comments they wish to make uh, before we wrap up the panel? I would just say, I think, and this goes to a point that Akila was making earlier, it's really important to keep in mind that all these judicial mechanisms, particularly I think of, of the ICG case in this way, not, these aren't a silver bullet for the problems of the Rohingya or the problems that plague Myanmar. They have to be understood as part of a broader political diplomatic process um, we tend, especially international lawyers, maybe we tend to focus too closely on the intricacies of a given judicial response, like this, or a, a, a given legal strategy. But at the end of the day, whatever happens in any of these um, proceedings, it's a part, it's one piece that can be then used to try to generate leverage or to, to Yasmin's point, to try to generate a change within Myanmar in the domestic politics and understanding of people within Myanmar, uh, which is really going to be the only path to lasting and meaningful change. So that, that's what my final comment would be. Okay. Any other panelists wish to make a final comment? Yeah, so in the same sense and, and in response to a previous discussion we were having, I, you know, it's very interesting to me, these international proceedings, how they talk about victims, they are about victims and survivors, but they are not part of them. And while the ICC has the participation and eventually down the road, perhaps reparations, 
it's still very limited, still very exclusionary in many ways, right? So yes, we have to see them for what they are, and obviously they are important, and they are and, and they are pieces of the puzzle of justice and accountability. But we also have to kind of think more about this. I think you know there, there's something that seems to be missing when we talk about international legal proceedings that really relate to the suffering of human beings. But these are not you know people that are part of those proceedings. So, so yes, there is lots of structural um, limitations there, but I think we need to talk more about them because uh, it's, it, it's one thing when we're talking about a case that is clearly state interest, but it's more striking to me when we are dealing with cases that are really about those people that are perhaps suffering, you know, uh, genocide and, and that have been, uh, you know, victimized from uh, crimes, atrocity crimes and human rights violations and, and to give them a a place in those proceedings. I think that's an interesting discussion that we started here. Okay, Akila or Yasmin, do you have anything else to add? Well, and maybe if I can just tack on to that, it's not just a part of the proceedings, but I think we have to restructure how we approach these scenarios in the first place and really be centering the demands of the community themselves, allow the community to be the architects of the responses, right? So, so that we don't treat the ICJ as a sil silver bullet. I can say that, you know, we do a lot of advocacy on Myanmar and we have for a really long time. And the ICJ case was incredibly important, but then it also seemed to kind of give an excuse to the international community to say, well, something's happening and therefore like, we don't really have to do as much. And that was not at all what the community was saying or has been saying. Um, and I think that this, agency question is also really important. So it's not just about us determining what procedures should be in play and then how to incorporate them into those, us as an international community, let's say, but rather to think about how we are making sure that we're directly centering the voices, the demands in how it is we design responses themselves. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of my, that's, that's something that constantly runs through and I think has to also be at the center of our response to this coup. Okay, Yasmin, if you'd like, you can, may have the last word. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo everyone else um, on this panel um, in saying this, that it's, it's really, really important um, that, yes, when we, when we look at the judicial um, processes and, and justice mechanism that are available on, you know, in the international realm, um, it's really important. And it has been, you know, it has been great in terms of our, you know, generating our publicity and, and getting people to, uh, you know, be drawn to, to the issues and, and started to really hear our voices. But often we, we become, um, in that process, we become sort of muffled <laughs> among all the voices that drown out our own voice and, and, you know, whether it be experts in different areas and, and human rights experts or, you know, uh, lawyers or whoever it is. And, and our, the question of our agency just really, really be, become, you know, the, basically be put at the, uh, on the back burner. And what really has been working, at least in, in my short you know, time working um, with the people on the ground, especially, you know, youth ethnic groups in Myanmar. Um, one particular group, or what kind uh, student groups that have been working um, on this project uh, called uh, Bridge MM, uh, Bridge Myanmar. Um, and this is led by Altsian, which is a really renowned uh, group that is working um, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and we've worked to convene with these, you know, young people for the past few months. And the first, very, very first uh, session that we've had, all of the propaganda, the military has basically sort of bombarded them, come out all in, all at once. And it was all about Rohingya being bad, Rohingya, you know, not being worthy of living in, in Myanmar because they're illegal, this and that. But then slowly we move away from that narrative because we started to have genuine dialogue. And I think that there is a lot more need of those sort of uh, uh, initiatives that, that need to happen on the ground and elsewhere, um, not just the dialogue within you know, different communities coming together, but also the focus of the international remedies um, or the, the, the justice mechanism should be about empowering people um, to rebuild their own communities because 
at the end of the day, the results of all of the various justice mechanism and judicial processes will not really provide or deliver all of the necessities that we will need in order to rebuild ourselves. So keeping that in mind and actually um, work that into whatever advocacy or initiatives that we all work on would be extremely important because really if we think about this by the end of the ICJ ruling or you know when the ICC case is over it's really going to be too late. All right, thank you all very much. I want to particularly thank our panelists for their time and their expertise, but also the audience members for sitting through our panel. All right, thank you all very much. And that brings this uh, panel to a close.